Welcome back to the Money Bomb 2012. Hi, I'm Linda West, and I'm recording out of Los Angeles, and I am so happy to be part of the Money Bomb this year. Um, I got to spend some time with everybody in Austin, and you guys are doing an awesome job out there. So, where do I start? Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how I ended up um, coming to find Alex Jones and why I'm here today. Um, basically, my ex-husband was a recording star, and um, you know we had a good life going. And I would do a lot of lounging around on the couch, watching entertainment tonight. And don't get me wrong, I have my own things that I've done. But at that time, I was kind of leisurely, and he would listen to Alex Jones all the time. And I'd be, and I'd hear Alex in the back kind of ranting about something. I'd be like, what? what? What are you listening to? And finally, he came over one day and he said, Linda, you're a conscious, intelligent person. What are you doing watching this dribble on TV? He said, you need to listen to Alex Jones. And so that's when I began listening to Alex Jones. And I got to tell you, at first, especially when you don't know a lot of things that are going on, when you're naive, when you've been drinking the fluoride, nobody told you it was in there. Um, when you start to hear the truth come in, it kind of really shakes your world. And at first you, you want to go into, you know, what psychologists call denial, because ultimately if you let some of this new truth in, it, it dismantles you know, your life as you know it, like all of a sudden, like for me, what, what do you mean the government's not taking care of me? You mean everything's not going to be okay because I live in the U.S.? Well, no, that's not what's going on. And it wasn't until little by little I started listening to Alex and then I got angry and I was like, okay, I, I need to be part of this. And I started doing videos on YouTube, you know, telling stories and helping wake people up, things I'd learned from Alex. And, you know, that's why I'm here today, because I wanted to be part of something bigger. And I think InfoWars is doing the only job out there that's important right now as far as news, because they're not bought by the mainstream media. They're not bought by a bunch of corporations. It's just Alex and his team members over there. And it's fully funded by you buying things from the store and things like the money bomb. And that's why it's so important. And actually, I even got a free membership because I'm part of the team to um, Prison Planet TV. But I even forgot my code and I came home and I bought it again myself because for me, I like to put my money where my heart Heart is and where I, when I think things are important I want to put my money there so that's why I myself donate to Alex Jones so moving on um, today I have a really wonderful guest for us uh, Max Egan is a very amazing man and right there next to Alex Max Egan has been pivotal in waking me up to what's really going on in the world on a spiritual and a physical level uh, Max has an amazing uh, YouTube channel under AOD Scarecrow. He also has a website, The Crow House, which is really informative. Um, and he has many, many documentaries. His new one, Transformation, we're going to be talking about. But The Calling and The Awakening are just absolutely unbelievable pieces of work. And they're for free, and you can get them right on YouTube. So without another uh, moment here, let me introduce Max Egan. Hi, Max. I've been touring all around. I went through uh, Egypt and been through London and a lot of places in Europe, and I'm currently in Croatia, which is very interesting. Uh, I've been all sorts of places. actually ended up in Gaza for a little while as well, which was a, a real education. So it's uh, it's been good. I was going to come to the United States and see you, but uh, I haven't managed to do that. I've decided I'm just going to pull the pin and try to get home at the end of this month. Well, I'm not happy about that, Max. <laughs> I got the room all ready for you, and uh, okay, I guess I'll have to lure you next trip. I understand you've been all over the globe practically. So thank you for being here since it's early in the morning with you. And uh, so, Max, a lot of um, my subscribers, when I let them know I was going to be interviewing you, they had questions, so I was wondering if you would mind um, talking about a couple things they wanted to know about. Fabulous. Max, I was just talking about noncompliance and uh, your movie, The Awakening, and how, you know, you talked about that. And what are some of the ways that people can be 
civilly disobedient in a nonviolent way <laughs> and drop out? Well, I think that um, really when you look at the system, Linda, the whole system is based on fear-based mind control, the whole thing. And I've always said that the best form of non-compliance is, is love, really. The best form of non-compliance is getting on with your neighbours. You realise that everything that this system does, it, it's, it's a system that's basically designed to make, make humanity expendable in order to support the parameters of the system. So we're always making humanity expendable in order to support the economic model. So you do the opposite of that in all that you do. Um, that's what I do in everything that I do. I, I spend my life giving to people, basically, because the system demands that I don't. The system demands that I sell things to people. So, you know, I kind of do the opposite of what the system demands me every, in everything that I do, and it just works. My life just works that way. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people that have gone through different rabbit holes. They've gone down avenues of, of freeing themselves. People like Robert Paget in, uh, in Canada have gone down different avenues and free man, the free man movement, all this sort of stuff. But um, I think the best thing to do is to um, realise that we already live in a society. We need to take this society with us in whatever we do. So we just stop complying with the, with the parameters of this society. And like I said, the best, uh, the best parameter, the best thing is love. Best thing we can do is love. It's a bit, uh, a bit early in the morning for me here, guys. It's uh, six <laughs> o'clock morning here as well. By the way, you got me up early, so I'm not quite with it at the moment. Oh, you're 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 always great, Max. Um, you know, to, to take a quote of yours, I was watching one of your pieces, and you were talking about how. You know, um, the New World Order funds both sides of the war, and they try and tell you, well, we've got to go to war to make peace, and, you know, peace is war, and war is peace, and peace. And you, and you said, you, you, you don't go to war with the people to make peace, you go to peace with the people to make peace. And that's just profound. And uh, can you illuminate a little bit more on that? It, it kind of goes with your love. Well, you know, I mean, you, you don't go to war to make peace. I mean, it's just not what you do. I mean, and all of the wars are contrived. All of the wars that we, we fight are contrived. I mean, people that listen to this show should know that, that they're all contrived. None of the wars that we've fought in the last 200 years have been fought on any of the reasons that they, they gave us for these wars to have been fought. And recently I was just in Gaza, and that was um, that was remarkable just to see how people are, are used as political footballs to see the situation in Gaza and to see how it's never going to be healed. <clears throat> it's just there to create war. is is quite uh, quite shocking to go and see it firsthand. They're just they're just forgotten people, and you know it, we, we've got to we've got to start realizing what's going on here with these wars and with this whole system the way it is the way it functions. I mean. The, the whole system, it, it only functions because we, we hold it up, we support it, that's the thing. So we can, we can point the finger at the Rothschilds, we can point the finger at the banking cartels, we can point the finger at the governments, but ultimately we're the ones that are holding it all up. You know, I've often said to people that what your relationship with government is, is one of fiduciary trust, and we need to put it back into that as well. We need, we need to understand that that's what our relationship with government is. So we can't petition these people, we can't vote them out, we can't... Uh, attack them by using the parameters that they give us to attack them. We can't attack them using legal or political means. We have to put it all back into trust and we have to realise that our relationship with these people is fiduciary trust. That's how we have to deal with the system because the government are public trustees. That's all they are. They're public trustees. We give them the power that they have to enact the laws that they use to take our rights away to, to have these wars and to, to do all the things that they do because we don't realise that our relationship with them is fiduciary trust. So that's where I believe the solution lies. That's how we have to deal with the situation. We have to put it all back into trust and realise what our relationship with them is. That, that has to be how we deal with it. Yeah. And really when you look at it, it's obvious. It's absolutely obvious. Well, absolutely. I mean, we talk about the 1% and that we're the 99%, but the problem is, well, we're all one for one, but the fact is, until we get united, until we all remember that we're all 
one, you know, we won't be able to be as effective. Right now, they work on, you know, separating us through fear, through these different, you know, wars and things going on that say you're separate when, in fact, we're the same. Well, they do, but they, the thing is that even if we were to unite, I mean, what, what, what sort of a front do we unite on? You know, the front's got to be fiduciary trust. It's, it's got to be the united front that we use because, I mean, that's the only, that's the only means we've got. That, that's the only method that we've got of, um, of dealing with the system. You can't deal with it politically. You can't deal with it through the, the methods that they give you. You've got to do it through trust. That's the thing. So we've forgotten that that's what our relationship is. See, even when the president goes there and swears to serve the American people, when the, the president gets elected to office, swears to serve the American people, that is, this is showing that he's a public trustee. This is showing that the prime minister of my country is a public trustee. That's what these people are. So that's the way we have to look at it, and that's the only place remedy will be found. That, that's why we have to look at it as trust. You see what I'm saying? It can't. It can't be. It can't be looked at as as anything else. It can't be looked at as as your leaders. You can't have to operate within political parameters or legal parameters that they provide. You've got to put all of that after the trust agreement, which is the basis of your relationship with these people. That's why it has to be looked that way. That's the only way you're ever going to ever going to deal with it. And that's the best form of non-compliance. Absolutely. I mean. Start working out what, what's going on with this trust agreement before you even get to the political side of things or even get to the legal side of things. You know, if you're claiming you have the, the, the law or can create the legislation which you're going to use to uh, do all these things to my, to my society, then let, let's look at where you get that power from because it's a trust agreement. So that, that's how we have to deal with it. And when, when you get enough people that can, can look at the world this way and... and Stand in their own personal power in order to make this happen. That's when you'll get some real change. That, that's about the only thing we can unite them on. You know, there's certain uh, symptoms we can use to hopefully unite them, things such as coal seam gas mining, which I thought would be a, a great symptom we could use to unite the people because, I mean, that's something that affects everybody. But even, even when people do see something as major as coal seam gas mining right in their face, again, they still don't know how to unite so that, that's where it all has to come back to trust. That's, that's the front that they need to unite on is, is fiduciary trust. Good points. Good points, Max. Now, I had a lot of people that asked questions. I just want to get a couple in because we're moving through this hour pretty quick. Um, what are you happy and positive about, Max? That's what a viewer wanted to know. That's a question for you. What am I happy and positive about? What do you see good? Oh, look, I, I see it all as good. I mean, I see it all as opportunity. I really do. I think that all of this really negative stuff that's happening, I think this is providing the human race and human consciousness with the greatest opportunity we've ever had for, for real freedom because I don't think we've ever been free in the past. I don't think there's ever been a time in human history when we've actually been free. Yeah, you know, right. We've right. had freedom of choice, but we've never really had freedom because I don't think we've ever been emotionally evolved enough or spiritually evolved enough to deal with freedom. But I think that now we are actually getting to a situation in human history where we might just be getting that, that spiritual evolution happening. We may just be psychologically evolved enough now to deal with the concept of freedom. And I think that all of this in-your-face stuff that, that is, is in our face is, is being provided for us to give us that opportunity. You know, we wouldn't be waking up if it wasn't getting so negative. So, yeah, I, mean, I think it's all positive, Linda. Yeah, I, I'm with you, Max. I, I mean, I see a lot of dark things happening, but I see, like you said, people waking up from that because sometimes, you know, if, if there's not something bad going on people are just slumbering away it's just like you know and finally we start to see things happening and people start waking up and the important thing is is so many people they get lulled to sleep with tv i know you're an anti-tv person or food or whatnot or alcohol and they just get in this kind of sleepwalking spirit realm where they're they're not in themselves they're not actually feeling or seeing what's going on and then when they actually do start to wake up like you said this whole concept of freedom when you know 
we think we're free, but we're not that much different than China in the fact that all the things that get filtered through, you know, the propaganda that is mainstream news before it gets to us. But moving on really quickly, another question that's, you know, goes along with this, 2012. Now, I'm an author on books about 2012. I, I connected a code, spent time with scientists in the rainforest. Terrence McKenna has his time wave zero theory where he shows at the end of the Mayan calendar that we are about to go into the most novel time in all of history. He supposed that it wasn't going to be the end of the world like many people theorize, but that something so novel such as uh, time travel would be invented, that would, it would change everything we know, that we would cease to think of death the same way or aging or even any linear movement because we could go back and forth. Therefore, time would not act as we know it and we'd be entering a, a new paradigm. What are your feelings about 2012 and what do you see coming? Because December 21st, 2012, it's right around the corner here. So what are your feelings about that? Yeah, look, I, I don't think it's going to be the end of the world. I really don't. I think that it's the end of one cycle and the beginning of another. Um, uh, I, I, I find Terence McKenna's views to be interesting. I find them to be very novel as well. I, thought, yeah, I mean, the idea that something novel could happen is a novel idea in itself. And, you know, I mean, I don't, again, I think it's an opportunity. I've never really placed a lot of lot of credence on the whole 2012 concept. I mean, I think it's a bit of a red herring, but, again, it, it, it could be an opportunity as well. I mean, it would appear that the planetary frequencies are rising. Even the fact that we're having conversations like this and doing shows such as this shows that there are certain frequencies of consciousness that are rising. And that's not anything new, it's just the way things seem to be going. You know, people are waking up. It's, it's the first time in, in human history we've been given an opportunity to be awake. And so I, I, th I think it's a good time. But, you know, it's something we have to participate in. If there is going to be a change in 2012, then it's going to require audience participation. That, that's what I think with 2012. I don't, I don't think that it's something we can just sit back and and wait for the world to change on that date. I, I, you know, I think the people that are waiting for that are going to be greatly disappointed come December 22nd. Mm -hmm. but, you know, I, I think it's, it's an opportunity, but, you know, we have to participate. Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of people say, oh, well, it's just Y2K, and, um, you know, it possibly could be. But then again, it's not just the Mayans, uh, I like to say, that have pointed to this date. It's the Egyptians, the Sumerians, Mother Shipton, Nostradamus. A lot of different cultures have pointed to this exact date, which just makes it interesting to look at, because why are they all pointing at this date and what's going on? Um, like you said, I, I see a lot of positive, higher energy coming up. We see these you know, rebellions all over the world of people not willing to be enslaved anymore. And that's beautiful. That's spirit rising. That's people taking action. And so, yeah, I, I'm with you. It's, it's going to be a human movement that changes things. I, I don't really see any devastation coming. But on that point, Max, you're in Australia, and uh, you know our elections are coming up. Uh, do you have, do you have a, a, a favorite between Romney and Obama? Look, uh, a favorite, I think. <laughs> <laughs> You're using the word loosely, I think, aren't you? <laughs> right, it's like saying, yeah. mean, do you like uh, your spinach or your collard greens? Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah I, I, I can't say that I'd honestly say uh, I have a favorite from those two, no. Um, I don't. I don't think it matters. I honestly do not think it matters one boot who wins, not one little bit. You know, um, it, it it might keep certain people happy if one face is up there for a little while longer, but uh, I, I don't think it makes any difference. I mean, the the agenda goes on. It always does. It always has. It it, it makes no difference. I think that they'll probably keep Obama in there for a little while longer yet. Well, I know, you know, we can't bet over here in the United States, but Paul Joseph Watson, um, our anchor out of London, 
they bet they all bet over there and they said he said the last time that he mentioned it he said obama was winning 70 to 30 with the bookies so i don't know if that's still going on after the lackluster debates he just put in but I mean, um, they were both lame, and they're both owned by the same people. That's the joke of it all. In fact, Obama was so bad, I almost it almost seemed like he was, like, taking one for the team or something. Like, I don't know, if he was a professional athlete, I would have said he, like, purposely threw the game. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, which of the puppets they put in, for sure. Um, so what's going on in Australia and um, your politics over there? Well, yeah. Look, it doesn't. It doesn't matter which one. Which one they throw in. You see, and it doesn't matter. See, they can have debates that are that bad. The, the people, people don't even notice anymore. Did you see the review that I did recently of the uh, of the uh, the Middle East defence uh, lobby, Middle East uh, defence lobby, talking about uh, talking about a false flag operation in Iran? I did a, a, re a video on the roof of Gaza. Of a rooftop in Gaza. Yeah, please tell please tell everybody about that. But yeah, but the, they were just talking about how they're just going to do a false flag operation, and it, it, they didn't cover it up at all. It, it doesn't matter anymore. They just tell you. So I mean, Obama can go and do a debate on television. It doesn't have. They don't even have to pretend that it's any good anymore. They just go up there and speak the words. It doesn't matter. You could you could sit there and be reading a, a cartoon script. <laughs> and people wouldn't notice. They wouldn't notice. If you read the script with sincerity, they would not notice that you're reading a cartoon script. Okay, America's not that bad. <laughs> I think they might notice that. I, we are pretty dumbed down, though. I mean, man, when uh, Dan Padani went out on the street asking people about the Constitution, well, they knew the Simpson characters, and they didn't even know the Constitution, so that was pretty pathetic. But Exactly. Exactly. So, so this is what we're dealing with. They, they can tell you now. Uh, look, we're going to fly. It's, look, you know, if if the Ameri if the American president can't get us to war, perhaps it would be best if someone else was to start the war. You know. Right. Right. And right. They're just telling you blatantly what they're doing. So, and look, I can't tell you what the politics are like in Australia at the moment because I've been right out of the news because I've been travelling. I'm still in Croatia at present. Mm, mm. Well, so let me tell you the latest thing. <laughs> okay, I, I, I'm, I hate to laugh because it seems like, you know, I don't care, but they just arrested uh, a terrorist that was going to blow up the Federal Reserve in New York City. Now, let me tell you this, Max, because you're going to love this. So at first, it just comes out with 21-year-old man was going to blow up the Federal Reserve. And I'm thinking, oh, boy, somebody on Occupy Wall Street just took it to the next level because we all know how everybody feels about the Federal Reserve. But, no, it ends up being um, this gentleman. Uh, I don't – he sounded like a Muslim name. He's not from there. I can't remember where they're saying he's from now. Anyway, one of those long names that sounds Muslim. And they're saying it was a terrorist act that he was going to blow up the Federal Reserve. But – the FBI said, don't worry, we actually had our hands through the whole thing. We got the van that he used and the bomb material. So then it's like, okay, so this guy was on Facebook, maybe saying something, you know, inflammatory. When did the FBI come in? And if they were in control of everything, it wasn't really a terrorist attack, was it? Because they were in control of the bomb. And this is the kind of stuff that's going on over here where you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> so what was it? Was this an FBI entrapment thing or was this an actual terrorist act? Yeah, that's what's going on over here. A bunch of more confusion, basically. I heard a little bit about that, actually. I heard a news report someone sent me about how the FBI um, sold him the 1,000-pound bomb and they sold him all the stuff that he needed to make the, make the bomb and they sold him the whole thing. So, yeah, I I mean, I mean, that's not the first time they've done that either. And you're like, oh, no, but we they were part of the Batman thing during the time when the U.N. was trying to outlaw our guns. No, they had nothing to do with setting that guy up who just hung around looking all drugged up and got arrested. It's like, great, no. isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. great. Let's just find some unsavory character. We'll set him up to be a bomb manufacturer. We'll sell him all the parts. And then we can say we caught a terrorist. I mean... Fantastic idea, and this is how they do it. It's, it's, they don't even cover it up anymore, Linda. That's the thing. So, yeah, it doesn't matter about the presidential debate. It doesn't matter about what they tell you because people people don't listen. They don't pay attention. 
Now, Max, over in Australia, because over here they're always trying to limit our gun rights, you know, even during the debate they brought the question up and both of them danced around it, of course, because so many Americans are pro-Second Amendment. But in Australia, they took away your guns, right? What year was that and, and how'd that go down? And what do you think about that? Because I get Australians writing me all the time saying, don't give up your guns, darn it. Well, look, they did that was back in the, uh, the, the early 90s. And they did it with um, the Port Arthur massacre, Martin Bryant, who was a patsy. I mean, there's no way that all happened the way they said it did. Not possible. But Australians are you know, very, they can be very apathetic and you can talk them into things. They're very compulsive people. And uh, when the government uh, said, yeah, you've got to give up all your guns, I went, oh, yeah, okay, no worries. We'll give up all our guns. We can't have anything terrible like that happening. Of course, there are a lot of people who didn't. There are a lot of people who buried guns around the place, and uh, there is reports of large cases of guns buried around the place. But, um, you know, they, they did do it very, very quickly. But it shows how, how easily it can be done <clears throat> with simply staging a false flag operation, which is what the whole Port Arthur massacre was. But, again, okay, with Australia, you've got a very disunited population because you've got... <clears throat> only 22 million people <clears throat> in this country, but they're spread out over the whole country. So you've got wide open spaces and you haven't got a lot of common unity in the community. So it's very easy to get, get people to do things like that when they're, when they're a disunited community. Something about in America, at least you've got you know, pockets of united community. You might have a, a disunited country as a whole, but you've got pockets of community that are, are kind of united within themselves very often because you're very densely populated. We don't have that here in Australia. Yeah, yeah. So, Max, uh, let me just mention to everybody, um, if you're wanting to donate to the Money Bomb, you can uh, call in to 882-253-3193. And if you're wanting to call later, we have a call-in number, two. if you want to call in and talk to the guests. Um, but, Max, let me ask you one last question I think we have time for before. Um, somebody wanted to know your opinion on orgone energy. Is it possible? Do you see it ever coming into being in our lifetimes? What are your feelings about that? Look, I've got a lot of organite that people have sent me. I don't know what to, to think about it. I mean, it's, it's there. It's all over my bench at home. I love this stuff. I think it's quite beautiful. I, I like the feeling that I get when I'm around it. Um, that, that's about all I can really say. I mean, people swear by it. Some people don't. So, I mean, try it out for yourself and see see how it feels. Um, I, I like it. I like I like being around the stuff. But I mean, it, it, it's not going to save the world. It, it all <laughs> takes audience. It all takes audience participation. Now, everything we do takes participation. Now, we can uh, get all these energy devices to keep ourselves up to the right level, but we can just do it in ourselves anyway. We don't really need anything that's external to ourselves. All we need is ourselves. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. But uh, all we need is that um, that spark that's, that's within ourselves. That That's how we change things, by changing that spark, changing the energetic state that we're in, realizing our own power and applying that to the world that we live in. That's how we change the world. We don't need anything that's external to ourselves. But that's, that's something that people often miss. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you there, Max, because so many times people will be, well, well what can I do? And a lot of times even get weighed down, myself in included, like, how much can one person do? The, the problems, they seem so enormous, and so many of them. And ultimately... What we can do, like you said, is if we just really stay in that love-centered place, caring about each other, making movements because we care about each other, we care about the world, we care about our children, and not getting too caught up in the anger and the fear, um, we can make a difference. And, uh, you know, it sounds kind of Pollyanna-ish, but ultimately I'm hoping somewhere along the way that 100th monkey theory kicks in and if enough of us are in the right place and want the same good thing, that that will become the uh, critical tipping point and, and we'll see a different world. And that's what I have to believe in and that's why I keep getting the message out and, and I, I know you do too. So 
any parting words that you can leave with everybody today, Max? And well, that is that is uh, truly the point, and it isn't it isn't Pollyannaish at all. I mean, you can change the world by by changing your energetic state, but you've got to apply it to the world around you. That that's the thing that people miss. You know, we we can do things. You know, one one small voice can make a difference. You know, I'm living proof that it can, and so are you, and so are people like Alex. I mean, there's there's people that are just one voice, but they've made a difference, and only because they're willing to participate. They're willing to get out there and do what they can and lead by example in what they do. And that, that's how we change things. You've got to lead by example in what you do. You've got to participate. Put yourself in the right energetic state, but, but don't just lock yourself away from the world. Don't go building an alt community. You know, we already live in community. We just have to fix the community that we live in. And we do that by applying ourselves to it. Yeah, and I, I, I do it simply by asking questions, asking the right questions to the right people, always being polite in, in all that I do, but, but not, not backing down to these people. You know, that that's, that's truly non-compliance, is, is, is knowing who and what you are, because that's ultimately what you're searching for. All the rabbit holes you go down, what you're looking for is yourself. And once you find it, you, you realise the truth of that. That's the truth. Amen. Is that not the truth? It all comes back to you, finally. So, Max, people can find you if they want to find you. Your website is The Crow House. Your YouTube is AOD Scarecrow. Um, they can also find your documentaries on your YouTube channel. Is that the best place to go or The Crow House? Yeah, the YouTube channel or the Crow House, it's all there on the Crow House. You can find a link to the YouTube channel, the Facebook page. The, it's all there. You can contact me via the Crow House. The forums are down at the moment. They've been hacked again. That You get that. You know. <laughs> yes, lovely YouTube. The minute you start putting out any real truth, I know Alex's channel goes through this all the time, and they just uh, stop giving you views or they won't let you uh, upload something or whatnot. I know you get a lot of that, too, because your channel is so big. And because you've done so much to help, Max, I really have to say to everybody, if you haven't gotten a chance to ever listen to any of Max's radio interviews or his videos or, or his documentaries, they are amazing. And it's also a really great way because, like you said, Max, I don't know about you, but you know, just reaching out and talking to people can be so fearful because people don't want to talk about real things. They don't want their world shattered. And to find a way to bring up a very important and sensitive subject and just have a real conversation human to human, that that's part of being an info warrior. That is hard in itself. I'll be in line and I'll be like, I want to tell them about Prop 37 and GMOs and like while they're standing there with Wonder Bread and their three kids. But, you know, the fear thing comes up. But you have to work through that because that's what love's all about, really. Having enough love for the other person to be like, well, I don't feel comfortable saying this, but, wow, you should know this just in case. And anyway, Max, it's early for you. It's late for me. And um, I want to thank you so much um, for, for coming on and um, taking time. And I'm going to have to really chastise you for not getting to L.A. to see me, though, on this trip. I, you know, we'll, we'll talk later about that, Max. <laughs> Yeah, not a problem. Sorry about that. I just got burnt out and decided it was time to go home. You're just afraid I'll take you out surfing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> okay, Max, is there anything you want to say before we go? No, look, um, that's about it. Uh, thank you for having me on. Sorry about the shaky start. Uh, remember Palestine? Remember Palestine, folks? I can remember Palestine wristband on. I was just there. Don't forget Gaza. I'll say that. Okay, Max. And you can watch those videos of Max on YouTube in Gaza, and they're really worth watching because they really moved me. So great job, Max, and uh, stay safe. And uh, we will talk to you soon, and thank you so much for uh, being our guest tonight and being part of the Money Bomb 2012. Thank you, Lynn. Bye-bye. Well, everybody, we're going to Jakari Jackson next, right, for the Money Bomb? Okay, so everybody, thank you so much. This is Linda West. I'm signing off here in Los Angeles, and Jakari Jackson is coming up next, and you all know how 
thrilling, exciting, and handsome he is, so you want to stick around for that. And once again, let me give you that number if you want to donate to the Money Bomb. It's 882-253-3193. And you can help us all get the news out more. And thank you so much for watching me. And everybody, a big kiss. And to everybody in Austin, I miss you. And thanks for having me on. calls and special guest coming up after this quick break. Two days to wake up the world money bomb. Call in to donate, 1-888-253-3139. That's 1-888-253-3139. 1-888-253-3139. Visit InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. When you're on the site, you can also tune in 24 hours a day to my daily radio broadcast. There's also a free iPhone app to listen to the syndicated radio show when and where you want. 